have a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mrs. Cons? Aye. Mr. Lavelli? Aye. Mr. Salt? Aye. Mr. Timby? Aye. All right, board quote, Ms. Cons. Thank you. Tonight, the quote is from Confucius. Education breeds confidence. Confidence breeds hope. Hope breeds peace. So education breeds confidence. This is why all of us here have a passion for being a part of this district, to instill knowledge, skills, and character, to give confidence to our students as they leave us post-graduation to accomplish all they set their sights on. Confidence breeds hope. My constant wish for all of our children is that they have hope in the unlimited opportunities that lay before them and hope that most days will be better than their last. Hope breeds peace that we as a community actively co-create a world where peace and hope are the foundations where our children can build a thriving life. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cons. Ms. Cortez, uh, how many people do we have signed up to speak to the board this evening? This evening, we have seven individuals signed up. Thank you. The board welcomes public comments. In the interest of respecting the time of all who are present, speakers must have signed up to address the board prior to 4 p.m and they must limit their remarks to two minutes or less. We also ask speakers to address the board and not others in the room. All speakers will be notified of the remaining time via the mounted monitors behind the dais. When the time has ended, the microphone will turn off. Supplemental written materials can be given to the security guards who are seated in the hallway outside the boardroom uh, or right here, and they will be delivered to the board secretary. Profanity or any disrespectful behavior will not be tolerated. We greatly value all comments from the public. However, the board will not respond this evening. Our excuse me, our first speaker is Rob Rogers. Good evening, everybody. I'm Rob Rogers, a parent of a junior at Liberty and a district resident. I'm also a candidate for state representative, which is relevant to my comments tonight. The day after the last board meeting, we hosted a Gen Z meet and greet, and I somehow got 16 people between the ages of 13 and 19 to meet with a politician on a Friday evening. Now, all of them were either D, uh, D20 students or they were new graduates. And I had a basic question for them. What are the adults in your life not hearing you say? I thought some of their comments might be helpful. They are so afraid of the future that they don't even like talking about it. They are 100% aware of why D20 teachers are leaving in large numbers and schools are filled with new teachers now. And they know why. Teachers in Colorado are drastically underpaid along with the actions and tone set by the district administration and the school board. That's their unprompted words. They told me about the anxiety they experience in school because they don't know where their peers stand on anything important. They were afraid of the social consequences of talking about real issues in the world today because they don't always know who they're talking to. And they explained while classroom environments were where students typically discuss some of these things, teachers didn't allow potentially controversial subjects to be discussed. Not because the teachers have an issue with controversial topics, but because they feared the backlash they might experience from parents. One of them said that school was supposed to be the place where they learned about new and different worldviews, where they had a safe place to discuss them and expand that worldview. The school was no longer a place for that to happen. Now school is just a place for kids to repeat what their parents say. Once again, these are their unprompted words. So every time debunked propaganda films are promoted from the dais, Every time nonsense invented by Christopher Rufo, the Heritage Foundation, the Bradley Foundation, Parents Challenge, Advocates for D20 Students, the DD11 Achievement Alliance, and others is parroted from this podium. Every time a board decision is made or a board opinion is expressed is based on anti-public education ideology, you're both being a pawn and you're hurting kids. And they know. Oh, do they know. Our next speaker is William Swavel. Good evening. Um, several months ago, you guys heard me talk about some school, uh, some books that I found in my daughter's school that were of concern and some other issues that we had uh, uh, that we had. So. I sat down with the principal not too long ago and went over the books. And of course, one of the questions he asked is, have you read those books yourself? And, um, you know, how do you know they're bad books? So I took him up on his challenge and I actually looked at those books. And I wanted to bring them up here. So 
This book here is one of them. It, it's written by an author who once celebrated a six-year-old transgender offering favors to men in his neighborhood. This one claims the drug war in 1980s was a fabrication of the Reagan administration to oppress black communities. One of the authors in this book jokes about spiking her, her conservative uncle's drink and offering birth control to school children from a van. This author tells youth that, that conservatives are unhinged and prone to violence. Then this last one <clears throat> belittles conservative white Christians and stipulates what six leftist issues kids should be activists for. That's not education, that's indoctrination. I urge this board to, to review the district and the different libraries, see what kind of books are being taught uh, in the classes or in, in the schools and, and do some research. I urge the parents to do the same. Thank you. Our next speaker is Laura Matisic. Good evening. I have had some health challenges that prevented me from attending the meetings the last couple of months, but I promised, as promised, I'm paying close attention. Mr. Lavalley, on June 16th, you've said some things that were very disappointing about our students' voices. I only have two minutes, so I can't get it to everything, but on public record, you pretty much said that student voices don't matter because they're not the adults in the room, that a lot of students come up with a lot of bad ideas. The student voice has a limit. And then you ask, does this make sense? No, this does not make sense, Mr. Lavalley. This is the opposite of what you swore under oath to do. To represent our students, you must hear what they are saying. Students are the most important voices that should be heard and not patronized by you. Our students pay the price or reap the benefits of decisions made in our schools by this board. Students are the future of this country and district. What we do now impacts the rest of their lives, not yours. I get it, women get it, and these students get it. Unless we spew manufactured outrage and propaganda like the newer Advocates for D20 Students group, we won't be heard. We won't be heard. You have ignored emails that I've sent you asking for transparency and honesty because you treat women like me, like your students. Their opinion is irrelevant and ignored. Remember, you work for us, the parents and students of D20 public. Ms. Matizic, yeah. I'm gonna stop you. Okay, then I'd like to I, I, Yeah, fine. Okay. You're accusing me of being misogynist, and I don't appreciate that, okay? You can disagree till the cows come home. Uh-uh, my turn to talk. Oh, I didn't know you, you were comment. Yeah, I'm gonna. Okay, well, we're Because you're accusing me of being a misogynist, which is a bunch of crap, okay? Did I'm I sorry. Go ahead, the clock, the clock will continue. Did I say that? We're gonna reset the clock back to 48 seconds where you stopped me. You have ignored emails that I have sent you asking for transparency and honesty because you treat women like me, like your students. Their opinion is irrelevant and ignored because that is what you've done. You've ignored my emails that I have sent you. Remember, you work for us, the parents and students of D20 public or charter schools. You are allowing people to spew anti-education rhetoric and I will not be ignored. Our next speaker is Catherine Zukas. Our next speaker is Brian Moody. As advocates for D20 kids, we stand for removing sexualization from our kids' classrooms. Whether it's discussion about pronouns or gender identity, these topics have no place in our schools. What does have room is a stronger focus on rigorous academics. Through my kids' attendance, I have personal insight into Mountain View, Da Vinci, School in the Woods, Academy International, Homeschool Academy, TCA, Chinook, Challenger, Mountain Ridge, College Pathways, Pine Creek, and now Discovery Canyon. I think I hold the record in D20. And it's been exhausting for me watching my wife do all that work. They all have strengths and weaknesses, and in one, in all of them is one common thread that there are wonderful, passionate, dedicated teachers sacrificing to improve the lives of our children. Yeah, and another common thread is that we're falling short. The most recent academic scores posted in the Gazette are not outcomes we can be proud of. 
and I've witnessed the lack of rigor that creates these outcomes. We need better focus on the basics. We need more focus on stronger, interesting education and focus on research backed methods for increasing our academic outcomes. The recent strategic plan fails to address these topics, which are the most crucial elements of education. The plan helps in the in the struggle for hiring teachers, which is a huge emphasis on through its valuing employees, and we have that part right. But the plan goes wrong in its obsessive focus on belonging and equity. Equity places an emphasis on perceived racial, gender, and other identity barriers. Are we communicating lower expectations because of lower outcome expectations of lower outcomes because of one's race or other group identity? We let's teach our kids to defy expectations and focus on their potential, not on the barriers in their way. Our next speaker is Julie Torres. Thank all of you for listening to me today. Uh, my son just started at Timberview and um, they're planning to take out the lockers, I guess this next summer and they're not able to use them for the current time being. So I was very surprised when I filled his backpack and felt how just how heavy it really was. Um, so in addition to having to carry that back and forth between class, he also has to walk home. And so I would appreciate if they could give the parents an option to possibly uh, supply our own locks to cut down on costs, or if they could at least provide them a cubby so that they could hang up their coat and unload some of the books that they're not using. I would really appreciate that. It cannot be good for them to carry that kind of weight. And I think that if you were visiting some of the schools that don't have lockers in and lifted some of these bags, you would also be pleasantly surprised or unpleasantly surprised just how heavy these bags really are. So I know that it pales in comparison to everybody else's comments, but I appreciate it anyway. Thank you. Our final speaker this evening is Derek Wilburn. Good evening, board, superintendent. Uh, I am a District 20 parent, as you all know, and want to talk tonight about the issue of pronouns. And the direction I want to take it is that this governing body needs to get together and come up with some sort of a district-wide policy for how we're going to address and handle this new issue of pronouns. This is all new. I mean, we've never had to deal with this before. This is, we're the first generation, the young generation today, that society has had to think about this. But societies evolve and we are evolving. So how are we going to handle that? Um, I mean, right now it seems to be it's not even school to school, it's actually classroom to classroom. Some people are comfortable with pronoun changing. Some are uncomfortable. Some students are comfortable. Some students are uncomfortable, which is when you that get paid the big bucks need to spring into action. For my sake, I mean, if a child says, I now want to be called they, does everybody therefore have to acquiesce to that child's wishes? Is it therefore incumbent upon all the teachers, administrators, all the students to begin calling that child what he or she wants to be called? And if the answer to that question is yes, if your child wants to be called they, and the school says my child must call him or her they, then that's your child making the rules for my household. And your child doesn't make the rules for my household, I make the rules for my household. Plus, what happens when we move beyond pronouns? What happens when one day a child says, I don't want to be called he or she or they, I want to be called lightning. Do we have to do that? And that's going to come one day. So I'm not pr proposing a ban. I'm not proposing anything other than to suggest that this governing body, get this on the radar, get into the room when you have your meetings, start formulating a policy that we all can live with. Everyone in this room has a different point of view and they're all valid. Let's come up with a district-wide policy so children aren't confused. When I go into Mr. Salt's room, it's this. When I Time's up. Thank you. That concludes our speakers for this evening. Thank you, Ms. Cortez. Board he is not. Uh, board comments, Ms. Kloniger. I'm glad I wasn't still eating because <laughs> you usually don't call on me first. 
Um, <clears throat> I brought pictures because that's what I do, but I also wanted to just say um, what a enjoyable back to school this has been. I would say um, <clears throat> with the opportunities that we have to do graduation, which most people don't see that as an opportunity, <laughs> this is the other benefit of being on the board is being able to go back and see the kids and see the schools doing what they do so well. So um, we have checked off one of our two perks. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I was able to visit, um, this is Chinook Trail Elementary for those of you who haven't been in their infamous uh, rotunda. Um, Pat Shoemaker did a great job of welcoming back his teachers um, on the first day back and uh, anyway, invited me to that lunch. So that's his staff there. Uh, next picture. <laughs> this is a um, picture of of what was supposed to be a really great slingshot. Um, if it was on a video, then you'd see that it went to about where that basket of, <laughs> of things are. So we started just tucking them into the crowd, but it was a lot of fun. There was a lot of energy and what was it? Oh, the t-shirts. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. It was a lot of fun. It was a back to school rally at the at the D20 stadium. Um, welcoming back all of our new teachers and and staff. And uh, it was it was a lot of fun. And and Allison's team and and all of those who were in charge of putting things together. We had great speakers and things like that that just started the year off right. I'll try and remember to say what things are. Then I went that night to a um, <clears throat> back to school night at High Plains Elementary, one of our smallest schools. Um, <clears throat> but they do not lack for uh, getting their people involved. The um, PTO there put together a, a back to school night with food trucks. And because they're small, they can pull everybody out and made it so that the teachers don't have to rearrange their classrooms after all of that. It was just fabulous. Anyway, it was just a great event. Next. Uh, this was the first day at Rampart. <laughs> Rampart's not my school, and my son is somewhere in that crowd, but I told him I was not going to walk him into the door, so he didn't know that I was there taking that picture. <laughs> but all the cheerleaders in the band were sitting there welcoming in the kids, um, and uh, the kids learned very quickly not to be late because if they were late, then they were the only one walking through the band and the cheerleaders, and that was a little bit more embarrassing. <laughs> Next one is some of the friendly faces that I saw, and what I wanted to just show you through all of these is not my part of the selfie, but those that are, I'm with. One is um, Michelle Tucker and Megan Sanders, um, AP and principal at the... Um, at Rampart, and I'm getting fed all these lines. <laughs> and Luke Conlon, one of the sweet kids at the at, in the band at Rampart. Next, I just wanted to show you the joy. Is what I was trying to say. Um, here's Steve Moran. He uh, was the one that started Pine Creek as the principal, and he was there to celebrate 25 years. This year's their 25th year, so it, they're going to do a lot of play on that, and it'll be fun. And I have a senior, so he might crop up into some of these. <laughs> once or twice. Next. Uh, this is just the joy again of all of the faces that I was seeing from Endeavor to um, Chinook Trail Elementary to High Plains Elementary teachers and students. And next. I started putting them together so I don't go one by one and bore you guys. Next, the other way. <laughs> is that the last one? Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, I just wanted to say I I thoroughly enjoyed, I appreciated Shelly driving me around, and um, this is an opportunity that we get to be a part of these schools and really see what is um, exciting for the upcoming year. So I'm excited to be here for a new school year. Thank you, Ms. Kalaniger. Mr. Salt. Thank you. Um, also attended in the all staff rally back to school. Uh, I did not use a slingshot. I was advised by Miss Allen early on that it was not a positive experience when they had tested those before. So I just started hurling them. I got them to the back couple rows. I felt really good about that until I got home and needed to ice my shoulder. Um, 
but it was great seeing everyone uh, and just some phenomenal speakers that we had uh, had that morning. And then this past week, we got to go and do our school tours. Uh, Mr. Smart drew the short straw, but he he pulled out and uh, had a great time anyways. And uh, <laughs> but it, as Miss Cloninger said, it was just fantastic seeing everybody's faces, seeing the smiles on all the kids, both the kids, the staff, the the teacher, everyone in those schools are just excited to be back. The energy levels were very high. And it was just, it's one of my uh, one of my favorite things to do is get around to the schools, especially the area line in the school year because everyone's fresh from summer. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is more for the board than for the public, um, is that uh, a few months ago, we had a quick discussion about the opioid settlement. Uh, I have received a few emails and invitations since I was the initial point of contact from the county. And so I was gonna just let you know that I will forward those around to everyone so that you guys have visibility. I am not planning on attending any of those at this point. So, but I just wanted to make sure that you guys were aware. Uh, Ms. Thompson, if you're interested, I can forward those to you as well. All right, thank you. Mr. Temby. Same comments as my colleagues here. Um, two great events. The uh, back to school rally with the entire staff was uh, tremendous. And again, it's nice doing it in the stadium with brand new turf and a beautiful day. Uh, and uh, went uh, on tours with Allison Cortez. Uh, so we saw nine schools uh, on uh, Tuesday morning. I think we've got a couple of photos here. Uh, now mine aren't all yeah mine aren't all pretty like uh, Heather's where they're in collage form with little graphics and stuff. But uh, uh, but uh, this is Air Academy. Uh, Dan Olson, who is our administrator of the year last year, uh, Dan Olson is also known because he bench pressed 465 pounds, Tom? Yes. In front of the entire group and that video went viral. So they call him Dan Swolson. So, um, and uh, next photo. Yeah, here we are at Edith Wolford and in the background, but it's portrait mode, but that is the brand, Doug Valley, I, Doug Valley I'm sorry. Uh, Doug Valley uh, Elementary on the Air Force uh, grounds. And that is their new um, playground in the background, uh, which uh, looks uh, fabulous. And let's see, where else? Uh, and this is, uh, this, there's a little story. We're at Doug Valley here. This is uh, Faith Leonard, one of the teachers. And her son and my son lived together at college. Mm -hmm. So she happened to be walking through the parking lot. So there's Faith <laughs> and she's a math teacher. So next. And here we are at Eagle View, uh, first day. Uh, and this is uh, one of our administrators. Uh, They're greeting students at the front. And Jamie Lester, the principal, is uh, on the other side. I don't know, do we have a picture of Jamie coming up next? Next. And there's Jamie. Uh, and uh, yeah, Jamie was trying to greet every single car on day one. So uh, he was trying to distract himself because when a board member shows up, the principals are good about being attentive to us, which they shouldn't be, but uh, uh, Jamie was uh, greeting everybody with a smile. Next. And uh, this is uh, Robin at uh, Aspen Valley, and uh, she was uh, juggling between the uh, uh, um, middle school and uh, high school that day, and they've just uh, uh, combined with our NOP program for the uh, district. and. Um, um, so they had a lot going on that day and that may be it or is there another one? Oh, oh boy. So this was uh, Prairie Hills um, and this is our uh, principal right next to Allison and our AP and uh, uh, the school was kind of showing off a lot of their capital projects. That's new flooring from the bond project that they're standing on and uh, just spirits were great and uh, it was a great day. It's one of the highlights of the year. So, and um, that's it, Tom, just, uh, you know, between graduations and the first day of school and getting back in the schools, it's, uh, that's uh, the fun part of this job. So, thanks. It is, thank you. Um, the back to school rally, everybody, you all had taken my thunder, but it was great. Although I was absolutely unable to throw them more than about halfway up and I tried and I saw some, younger guy down there. He was just and they were going way, way to the top. And I was very discouraged by that. I was everything I had. And and then of course 
I think Aaron, you were with me and, and we just started grabbing and throwing. And finally somebody said, stop, you're only supposed to throw like a third of them. We're like, oh, oops. So um, it, the sign was was only about this big on it. It should have been this big for us to actually read it. But it was a great rally. It was uh, just exciting. The weather was perfect. Uh, the teachers, everybody was just excited to be back. And, and I, I really appreciated uh, being there. It was just an honor. Um, I visited one of my new elementary schools um, last week it was their back to school night and I, I thought it was funny. I, I met one father. I just went up and said, hey, how you doing? And and his name was Oksan and he was from Turkey and he was a PhD economics professor at CC. So we started talking economics. Are we in a recession? Are we not? And we started talking about Turkey and Erdogan and, and you know, all that. And, and it was just a delightful conversation, just a wonderful man. In fact, he invited my wife and I for dinner, which we're going to maybe do the, this weekend. It was just just great. And then so we said goodbye. I met another dad and we started talking. And then, um, did I forget Nicole? I, how did I do that? Forgive me. All right, I'll finish and then, uh, I, my apologies. Anyway, so um, we, uh, uh, and come to find out he's from Canada. He's he's in the Canadian uh, Armed Forces. If you don't know, there's a lot of Canadian uh, military here. He was at Peterson. So I, and, and of course, what school was it? When I met a, a man from Turkey and a man from Canada, it was Academy International. Yeah, which so it was it was it was just pretty neat. Um, and I wanted to thank um, Ms. Thompson and Dr. Smith today. They they took me around. I do have a few pictures. I don't think the quality is going to be quite as good. We'll see. This was at the robotics lab. This was one of the robots that they built, which I thought was was pretty awesome. I'd never been in, in the robotics lab. That's at the Center for Modern Learning, which is out where Legacy Peak is. It was a really just a neat thing, and I forgot several schools pictures until later. So I, I just have a few. The next slide, please. Yeah, I know that that's me. Um, and that is at. Um, that is Madame de Bune, and that's at uh, Academy International, and that is a French immersion school. And I'm, I'm pretty sure those were first graders um, in, in their French immersion class. Next slide. And this was Madame Ortaleva. And I believe this was fifth grade as well. Obviously, the kids were bigger. They were doing work on their computers. Uh, next one. And this is uh, Mr. Jeff Sturk, uh, Mountain Ridge Middle School. Had a nice visit there. And then finally, uh, Carrie Bonilla at Rock Rimmon. Uh, she was a uh, ball of fire. It was just a lot of fun uh, seeing all my school. So I, again, I thank you all for, uh, for showing me around today. So I don't know how I missed you, Ms. Kahn's, um, but you have the floor. I wish I had pictures to culminate, but of course, walking out of the last school, I'm like, nope, didn't even bring my camera into any of the schools because I was just excited to go see all of them. But um, I just want to give shout outs to the schools I visited um, and thank Mr. Gregory for sharing your cabinet because it's so fun to get to be with you guys and know you. I got to go with Ms. Becky Allen. So we had a great morning. We started at Journey K-8, which if you don't know is our hybrid model school, a little bit more um, free form in their schedule, but robust in their academics and what the teachers do for the kids. So um, it's just, I've never been inside that building. It's got amazing spaces for the students. And I'm just really proud that D20 offers that to our families that need the flexibility. And Ash, who's their brand new principal, um, greeted just about every kid by name. I know she was there as the AP, but she knew every kid that first day walking in saying hi, and they were just thrilled to be welcomed by her. So I want to give her props. Um, over at Liberty High School, we got to visit with the other new principal, Matt Sisson, and the energy and positivity over there was palpable, especially because they had just finished their welcoming assembly. All the seniors were still out there covered in their confetti and whatnot, but it was uh, really fun to be there. Um, Mr. Sisson's bringing a really fresh perspective and positive perspective um, to Liberty, so I'm thrilled to watch their journey this year and walk with them. Uh, Corina Bierman over at Timberview, who some of you may have seen, she is, like you just described another principal, ball of fire. She is just passionate and just really builds up that school over at Timberview. So we arrived right as they were having an assembly about to start with a motivational speaker that they had flown in, I think, came in somehow. But some of my most memorable and important moments in school for me in public school was having those assemblies with motivational speakers 
So I would love to see more of that. I think I may have already mentioned that to Mr. Gregory a few weeks ago. So I was thrilled that she was doing that because it's really important for kids to be exposed to all those other thoughts and wonderful ideas. Uh, we went over to Explorer Elementary um, with uh, Ms. Driver, their principal, and Ms. Murray, their assistant principal. And we got to sit in on a kindergarten class for about 20 minutes. So I'm glad I didn't break the chair. You know, they pull out the chairs that are this big for us to sit on. <laughs> I should have sat on the floor with Becky, but um, it was just phenomenal how amazing these teachers and students are on their second day. And some of them first day because kindergartners at some school only started Monday or Tuesday. And just the way these kids um, just are so attentive and intelligent and the teacher just connects with them and we got to give little soar tickets to them so they could earn their their prizes. So that was really fun to be there. Um, we went over to New Summit Charter Academy. Also, I've never been inside that school. I encourage you to go see it. Really awesome. All of our spaces are just unique at every one of our schools. But they're building a gym there, which they're really excited about and um, almost done with their home ec room. So I was trying to get the name of the person who did their countertops. And then my husband said I was going to get in trouble for being a board member and asking for, <laughs> you know, a little hookup. But no, it was uh, they've done a beautiful job over there. They're five years of being open um, and just the space is just filled with love and learning. You can just feel it from everyone in that building. So awesome over there. And then last, we went to Mountain View Elementary School with Principal Hooper and Assistant Principal Gorsh. And um, their passion is just unbelievable. They, um, they've got these spaces outside their classrooms because their building is set up really unique. And it's, it's this convertible space where they can do group projects and um, interventions and just you can feel how productive it is for the students. It's really awesome. And um, they were one of the original digital schools, the one-to-one -one device thing. So they're they've, they're getting this new vision this year. So again, I'm excited to walk with them as they work with Mrs. Cortez to just expand on their niche and all the wonderful opportunities they have there. So we'll be going to TCA, all the TCA campuses next Thursday, and then we will be done meeting our new schools. So thanks again. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Kahn's. Uh, just a little note, um, the CASB, which is Colorado Association of School Boards Region 6 meeting is uh, next week, August 25th. I believe that you and I are the two that are going to attend that. So just a little note there. Mr. Gregory, uh, administrative comments. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> some of this is going to be a bit repetitive because it seems that uh, since I go last, I get to repeat some things, but certainly the last seven days uh, have been full of energy as you've, as you've heard. Watching students return to schools full of excitement is uh, both rewarding and a bit contagious uh, if you've ever been there at those times. Energy in our schools is at, a, at an all-time high. And I would also say not just uh, a lot of energy and high energy, but I would use uh, two words, uh, I guess, both free of fear, which was, I think, part of last year's energy there was still this intrepidation not knowing what was coming so i think that's gone so it's free of what i call fear and uh, also full of hope uh, so it was a bit different energy this year there was a lot of energy last year uh, you know coming back to school um, but it still is different uh, this year it's it's uh, I, I think it's uh, I'll, I'll just say genuine um, while there were uh, while all that energy was happening, there were still a few tears. Uh, as you can imagine from some of our youngest first time students, meaning kindergartners, uh, it's both exciting for them, but when it's time to say goodbye to mom or dad out the back of the classroom and they're in their classroom now in a new environment, uh, there's some tears. Uh, but also I think uh, with some excitement. Prior to students arriving, we welcome our staff back to the, the rally. Uh, and I just want to say once again, every year our student speakers, we have a senior from a high school speak every year um, and never fails that the senior speaker is the highlight of the of the entire event. And that was the same this year. I want to recognize um, Mr. Josh Lohr from Discovery Canyon Campus High School uh, who stole the show once again with his speech 
And in short, I would just tell you, it was very honoring of of the teachers that uh, had impact on him as he as he went through his educational career, all in District 20. I'd also like to extend a big thank you, not only to him, but science teacher, uh, Eagle View science teacher, Ms. Jacquet. Uh, both their speeches were uh, inspirational and motivational. Uh, and I also want to thank our board members for being there. I know this is probably the fifth time I've told you this now, but it means a lot for you to be there. Uh, it means a lot to staff for you to, to be there. Uh, even just to see you there is is important um, and not only being there, but by participating and uh, by demonstrating your amazing. It's a new set of words for you. Sling shirt skills. How do you like that? Pretty good for Tom. That's right. Uh, a few other things. The first day of school came with extra celebration for Bexley Shoemaker, a kindergartner at Chinook Trail Elementary School. Not only was Bexley braving her first day of school, she was also battling uh, or is battling leukemia. Her family has been a part of the Chinook Trail community for many years. In fact, two years ago, the elementary school wore pink shirts on Fridays to show their, show their support for Bexley. She's finally a student there and her prognosis is looking great. She is scheduled to complete her chemotherapy this November. So we wish Bexley the best. Um, I'd like to congratulate two incoming seniors, one at Pine Creek and one at Air Academy, who spent their summer break in the sky, Mr. LaValle, in an accelerated course, uh, Air Force Junior ROTC students Ramsey Stark and Andrew St Strub received their private pilot's license, and with the help of Colonel Huber, uh, they were both accepted into two different flight schools. We also want to congratulate Ryan Wendt, Sam Wilhelm, Terza Peters, Tessa, uh, I think it's Rodemaker, uh, Brennan Groth, Conrad Dawes, all from the uh, Air Academy Junior ROTC team. This weekend, they provided the color guard for the Colorado Air and Space Force Association Awards Banquet at Widener Field downtown. Also, uh, Nine News, uh, if you're familiar with, it's a Denver, I'll say major, Denver News Station. Uh, we'll highlight the Pine Creek High School marching band and segments on their morning news show, both tomorrow morning and again next Friday, August 26th. The newscast, you have to get up early. The newscast begins at 4.30 in the morning, extends till nine. We don't know exactly which segment of that uh, is, is gonna highlight Pine Creek, but congratulations to Ms. Margrave and her students for their deserved recognition in Denver and Northern Colorado. Oddly enough, at least in my house, I don't even get nine news, so I won't even get to get to see it. But those folks, no, folks north of us, will will get to enjoy Pine Creek. Uh, in response to the growing op opioid crisis, we are in final stages of developing policy regarding the use of Narcan in their schools or making it available. Uh, once policy is in place, we can then begin training the appropriate staff on such things as storage, administration of this potential life-saving. Uh, treatment. Staffing update just very quickly uh, regarding staffing. We're in a bit better place than we were two weeks ago, uh, but still not perfect. We still have teaching positions, some teaching positions unfilled, positions that are being filled by some other teachers or some other positions being filled by guest teachers and other positions being filled on a temporary basis. In other words, somebody has made a commitment maybe to, to get through the first semester, but certainly not ideal. Uh, we are still in need of classified folks in schools uh, and bus drivers and bus aides also. And I would remind everyone that our human resources team is hosting a job fair on Saturday, August 27th in this building from nine o'clock to one o'clock from anybody who, for anyone who might be interested uh, and we're still uh, recruiting heavily and, and still in the hiring process, even though we're at the end of the first week of school, unfortunately. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vi. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. And FYI, we have 19, 19 people uh, listening in remotely. We need a motion to approve the following resolutions. Resolution 257-22, approval of matters related to spash, staff specialist staff. Resolution 258-22, approval of matters relating to licensed staff teachers. Resolution 259-22, approval of matters relating to licensed staff, licensed support, special services provider. Resolution 260-22, approval of matters relating to classified staff. Resolutions 
22 and 262, 22 executive limitation policy, 2.1 treatment of students and monitoring report and MRE for the same. Resolutions 263, 22 and 264, 22 approval of monitoring report for executive limitations policy, EL 2.6 financial planning and budgeting and MRE for the same. Resolution 265-22, approval of federal impact aid official count date and authorization of financial chief financial officer as authorized representative. And finally, approval of the Board of Education regular meeting minutes from 4 August 2022. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mrs. Cons? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Salt? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. Thank you. Um, I do not see a need to go into a break, so we'll proceed. Uh, there is nothing pulled from consent. The next is superintendent's reports and resolutions. The 2022-23 student enrollment update, Mr. Gregory. Yes, Ms. Becky Allen, please. Good evening, very nice to see you, and uh, I'm excited to give this enrollment update because the main reason is it means kids are back. And it was so fun to feel all of that excitement uh, and energy in the schools earlier this week. So I appreciate the opportunity to be able to spend the morning with Mrs. Cons. It was a lot of fun. And I, I really did. I think that favorite was that kindergarten classroom. It was great. So this evening, I will go ahead and give you an update uh, regarding our student enrollment. Now, the data that I provided you, you know, the, to go ahead and honor when we turn in items for the board packet, please know that what is in your packet is data that's about a week old. So I am also going to share data with you that's as of 2 p.m. this afternoon, okay? Next slide, please. What you see on this slide is um, an important trend piece. Uh, on the left in red, that is our enrollment for 1920. What's important about that is yes, COVID hit that year, but it was not until March. This is our last pre-COVID enrollment. And if you take a look at that pink all the way on the right, you will see what our current enrollment is showing as of uh, August 9th, 26,734. As of 2 p.m. this afternoon, it wasn't very much different. It was 26,745, only 11 different. So what I gleaned from that, of course, we know in the green and the blue, we certainly know that COVID had a, a huge impact on our students, but what we can see is not only are we looking at knocking on the door of enrollment that is at a pre-COVID level, right now we are exceeding that level, which if you recall, we never had prior to these two years that you see, we literally never had a down year in enrollment. So what you can almost see is if we did a red to a pink, what we would typically anticipate if we were in a typical uh, series of, of school years. When you look off to the right, I wanted to give some context about where we are in terms of our projection. Now there's two types of projections. One is head count, that's the number of kids. And then one is funded pupil count. I always give the example that we can have two students two human beings, two head count, but maybe they're both half time, that's one funded pupil count. Funded pupil count, we don't have a good read, you know, a final read on that yet, so I'm simply sharing head count. If you look at our head count projection, you can see with the numbers as of two o'clock today, we're up about 253. Now, that is a good news story. However, these numbers are not finalized because here's what's still happening. We still have enrollments coming in. We are still working through the queue, we call it, of registrations coming in this year. We also have more withdrawals. So our registrars are working very hard to identify families who have left. The first 10 days, so tomorrow will be the fifth day, and then we have our five school days next week. We call those the whites of eyes. And what we're doing each day is schools are literally saying, okay, this person is here. I see their whites of eyes. And when we don't get a read on a particular student, registrars and other school staff are doing all they can to contact the families. It might be their child is sick. 
It might be they moved to New Jersey. It might be that they're still in Colorado Springs, but they went to another school district. It might be that they still live in the same place, but they've decided to homeschool. So some of these calls, they get resolved as we go day by day and those withdrawals happen in the system. But some families, we can't contact in that whole 10 day window. So if we can't, those students are disenrolled. Now, if the family comes back to us and says, hey, I'm so sorry, some, of course, then we work with them to get them enrolled. But the reason I wanna share that is that will impact these numbers because when that 10 day period is up, we certainly will have some other students who we didn't identify, we did not reach their parents and they'll be disenrolled. Next slide, please. The purpose of uh, this slide and the next one, they're not typical that I would share, but again, in the COVID environment, I think it, it tells a story here. So what you see is you see Journey K-8, the, the, the K-5 all the way on the left. In the middle, you see the middle school and off to the right, you see Village. Let's just look at Journey K-8 for a moment. If you take a look at the red, you see pre-COVID levels, 48 and 93 students. That was a typical pre-COVID level. Then you start to move to the green. Now we're in a COVID year. And you say, well, that's not that much more. But see those little stars up above it? If you look in that green box at the bottom, see that 66 bar for Journey K-8 with the star on top? you can pretend to add 1,762. So it's off the page with how high that bar would be of students who were still enrolled as a primary enrollment in their brick and mortar school, but they were not attending. They were going, they were staying home and doing Journey K-8. Same with the middle school, you can see the change. So as you can see, blue is last year, pink is now, we are really going back to much more pre-COVID levels here um, in terms of students participating in Journey K-8 and far, 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 far fewer students, if any, of that COVID only. We, we don't have that going on right now. We do have some families that opt to still um, stay home and not come into Journey K-8 on certain days, but the vast majority, as Mrs. Kahn's and I learned again on Tuesday, they come for some days and some hybrid work. For Village High School off to the right, you can see that their enrollment has really been able to grow with the space. And 450 is really what Mr. Gorsh can take in the space. And they really are very close to that. And I wanted to share, um, they also have a wait list of 190 students. So it's a popular place. And, and these students, again, this is not COVID related. These students come and have a hybrid environment where we did have some COVID related enrollments was on the blue. We had about a little less than 50 students who were completely just accessing the online. So these two slides tell me enrollment up to pre-COVID levels, we're seeing even an increase and we're seeing much more typical patterns in terms of our online only types of, of activity. Finally, next slide please, another, another just quick look at another indicator is how many students have withdrawn to, to be homeschooled. That green, you'll see, certainly not typical. Pre-COVID was what's in red, and you can see that it's continued to decline as we go down, down through, through the years. So what do we do moving forward? We will continue to work on this. It will be a process all the way through October. October is the official count, so it won't be after October, probably in November, that I'll really know the final funded pupil count. What will happen in December, we have one board meeting, I'll come and bring you that count and you'll, you'll consider it and uh, certify that, that count. And then in January, when we do the mid-year budget, this is a major funding variable. So we will true it up. And if numbers continue the way they are above projection, then that would mean that we have additional revenue that wasn't shown in our budget. I'm not seeing signals that it will be below, but again, below our projection, that would be a big shift. But again, we don't know exactly where it will shake out. Do you have any questions for me? Mr. Salt. 
I just wanted to thank you for for putting this together. Um, this was I thought the particularly the the slides with the Village High School and Journey Kate were really interesting to see how we've, we've kind of normalized. Um, really interesting that they're at capacity at Village High School, so I knew that was coming. Thank you, Miss Allen. I was just I was going to say I, I appreciate Mr. Gorsh kind of squeezing a few more students in because I had the school last year and he, he said we're basically full. And when I saw these numbers, I went, yeah, he found he found room for just a few more kids. So uh, I know it's a great program as well as our, all of our other programs. Just, just I just want to make a comment when let's just say we end up with with 200 students more than our, our, our budget, if you will. It's about nine grand per child. That's one point eight million dollars. Now, our budget was upside down planned. Um, that that that's just it's it's about knowledge, skills, and character. It's not about the money, but the money is very important, and I just think that's an important thing for people to understand. It is a big deal. Um, it, it's a good news story. This is a very good news story for our district that our count is up. Yes, and again, we've returned to something that was simply the norm in District 20. Always more enrollment year after year, and we've we've gotten through. Our staff have done a great job, and we're kind of weathering this part. And it's really nice to welcome so many families back. Absolutely, it is, and and it's a it's a problem when you have a lot of kids and and you have to squeeze them in, but it's a better problem than when you're getting smaller and now you have empty classrooms. That that's a real that's not a problem we want. So uh, thank you, Miss Allen. Mr. Lavalier, <laughs> just one thing on your comment. J depending on how the kids fall into classrooms across the district, uh, sometimes. Uh, Mr. Smart might be able to address this a little bit more, uh, and I don't put him on the spot, but the, sometimes additional staff has to be uh, allocated to schools too. So the, there's a net piece to that, that 1.8 million I think you mentioned, that sometimes that there's just embedded staff in there. Sometimes if the kids fall into the right classrooms at the right grade levels, um, there's seats available and it, there's not really an additional cost to it. Other times there isn't, they have to open up a new, section or a new classroom or something like that That's to all. be sure yep thank you for the clarification and the charters of course also have some of those dollars as well um you know about 15 percent 16 percent of our student population so they would you know that overage some would go to them as well yes th that's a good point thank you um next one is new licensed staff orientation mr gregory yes, dr field please Hi, good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Koslack, who is going to give you your presentation on new licensed staff orientation. Good evening, board. Thanks for having me again this evening to talk about new licensed staff, which is a very exciting time for us. It's before all the students come back, of course. And this year we got to welcome 250 new licensed staff to the district in terms of the orientation. We hired more, um, but it was an exciting hiring year. Um, and you can go ahead and advance the slide uh, if you don't mind. Um, there's three days of new licensed staff, and in a way, when you have 250 folks coming in for training, it's like setting up a school for a couple days with scheduling and some of those dynamics. So a lot of work goes into it. We're uh, super excited to welcome them, and we appreciate some of you for joining uh, on the first day. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of, uh, kind of investments we made in terms of how we plan, and we put a lot more emphasis this year on thinking about how we implement and plan with uh, board ends in mind or the global ends, and also the strategic plan. Those came really front and center in our planning process this year and how we engaged our new licensed staff, which includes teachers and support uh, professionals as well. If you could advance that slide, please. So the global ends that we incorporated into our planning, um, as Mr. Lally mentioned, were around knowledge, skills, and character. and we. Uh, brought those to the forefront in our planning process. If you could advance the slide, you guys know these quite well, the knowledge and skills. I'll just advance through these to say 1.1 was front and center in terms of knowledge and skills. Second, next slide. And character uh, dynamics as well. So those were built into both our presentations and in how we thought through our planning process. Next slide, please. We emphasized uh, really at the beginning, how are we gonna welcome folks in and make them feel? Uh, and that included uh, attention to our mission. Uh, and this came front and center in uh, many of our presentations, so they were threaded in uh, throughout, uh, including how folks were welcomed right out of the gate in that first day at Pine Creek High School, which is where we hosted uh, two of the days. And the excitement of having bands playing, 
uh, students involved, JROTC, students singing the national anthem. It was quite powerful uh, uh, experience. And part of it is, how are we going to educate and inspire students to thrive? So that was at the front of how we train our new staff and get them acclimated into the district, even if it is somewhat of a fire hose effect in those couple of days. Next slide, please. We talked a lot about our values, uh, that people are the heart of our success, relationships matter, quality education, like what are our academic expectations? How are we gonna make sure uh, all staff understand that coming on board, the high level of academic uh, expectations uh, for everyone uh, coming into B20? Next slide, please. And we talked about our vision, this creative and personal uh, learning opportunities accessible to all students, prepping them to thrive in an ever-changing world. We thought, how do we help train staff with that same mindset so that they can empower students through this lens? So uh, next slide, I'll uh, now dive in um, to the guiding questions we used um, as we planned each session. So we had lots of teachers involved, so to speak, instructors, including several folks in this room, cabinet, and others that I'll talk about briefly. Uh, but we really use three questions to prioritize uh, how we, because there's so much, you can't do it all, so we use some things to prioritize. And here are the three questions, if you could advance uh, the slide. Question one, how do we want new staff to feel upon their first days of coming into the district? And this was really important, so we talked about this a lot in alignment with some of those other uh, topics I have already mentioned, making sure they feel welcome, treated as professionals, but also inspired, motivated, engaged, capable. Uh, and you'll get a chance to see the feedback at the end of my presentation today too, um, how we took some measures of that as best as we could. Next question, please, or next slide. The next question we really uh, pushed on was what do we want them to know? Uh, so there was an emphasis on our why, uh, and that came out in many of the presentations. Also, who everyone uh, is in the district. Um, that's an important piece. Um, some of the big systems and platforms, big priorities, and then details about their schools and platforms. So one of the things I want to talk about just for a moment is we added a third day uh, this year to new IT staff, um, which was one of the recommendations that we've been looking at feedback for several years. And so the district had two days of time to train, uh, work them, and schools had one day in the middle. And I think that afforded us some nice time. Of course, several people think we need more time because uh, it is a fire hose effect. Uh, next question, I'm going to talk about the third one. And the other is what do we want them to be able to do? Part of the emphasis this year is we want folks to practice and do things more and more so they can take it back into the classroom as soon as possible. So you'll see some of those pieces there. Finding, basically teaching them how to fish too. We have a lot of systems and so part of our job was help to teach them how to find that and know where to go for the help. All right, so let's dive into the day. So if you could advance. So day one, that was on August 3rd at Pine Creek. Um, uh, we really looked this day as kind of the framing uh, of the district uh, strategic plan, our pathway forward. Uh, we had information technology in our department, of professional learning, payroll operations, legal, and human resources. So a lot of the kind of emphasis on that day you can kind of get a feel for. Now the next couple slides, I will not cover all the detail within them. I'm going to go through those because I know you guys have had the copy ahead of time. And then I might address a couple things just based on some feedback and questions ahead, if that's okay with everyone. All right, next slide. So one of the sessions was one, uh, facilitated uh, by Superintendent Gregory, Dr. Jim Smith, and Allison Cortez. Uh, and I'll just state right out of the gate, it's fairly unusual um, for a large school district for a superintendent to spend that kind of time with new licensed staff for a whole day getting to know folks. Um, and that always comes back as well received comment on that because um, most districts just don't do that of our size. And they really dove in not only just a welcome, but also around the D20 culture and the strategic plan there's a lot of really com uh, positive comments about that session. Next slide. We had an, uh, a session that combined information technology, IT, with professional learning. So we did an experiment in this one. So you'll notice the fishing pole uh, where folks really got to learn by doing and they went fishing. So they got to learn how to fish, prizes, fishing nets, crew was kind of decked out in uh, fishing gear. Uh, this session was probably, it was a lot of fun. I got to join in, kind of ride their coattails a little bit. Uh, but that was led by Shelly Kuzer and her team, and it was really diving deep into IT platforms, more the technical side of the requirements. Next slide. That was professional learning, which I got a chance to lead with our team, and really it's around the vision and goals for PL and those systems, and we got to participate in that fun of just guiding them through practice on time to do things. It was a big emphasis there. Next slide. Uh, legal uh, uh, had a, you know, a, a huge session, too, around all the things that one of the framings is how to keep teachers in the classroom and out of the courtroom, uh, which is a really important uh, component of the work. 
um, is becoming more and more important as we move forward to kind of get a feel of some of the key topics covered there within legal. Next slide. Payroll, important questions. How and when will I get paid? Uh, amongst other things in terms of platforms and systems. And you can see some other kind of pieces within that. And uh, including uh, Para and Workday, uh, one of the platforms they work with. Next slide. Operations led by Brett Smith uh, and his team really got into safety security. The emphasis here was on uh, security, also on uh, risk management. So part of the emphasis is, again, what are the highest priority things we can get in front of teachers and staff in general? Keep them out of trouble, right? So and keep them safe and secure. So that was the emphasis of that session. Next slide. Human resources um, led by Cameron Smart um, and all of his directors uh, did some great work on culture, basically professional boundaries. Again, part of the emphasis, having some fun with it. So they introduced a little bit of gaming uh, structures in it and quizzes to have a little bit of fun, make it a little lighthearted, which is typically a pretty heavy topic, but they use some scenarios to uh, keep folks engaged as well. Next slide. All right, so the second day folks had in their schools, they had a chance to go spend a whole day in their schools. And so schools all handled this differently, although they did collaborate and talk a lot back in the spring about what their plans were. And so they shared some best practices on how to welcome uh, new staff into their own buildings. So that was kind of a sample site goals, alignment to the strategic plan, procedures, tour, of course, tours, introductions, and those type of things. So that, that second day, I think, was a nice addition and we appreciate Becky uh, helping us find uh, resources to make that happen this year. Uh, next slide. So the third day was coordinated largely through learning services in conjunction with uh, IT as well. So uh, Dr. Field um, and our team helped lead uh, four main sessions for this day. Um, we did incorporate a couple other things, but there are four sessions that were fairly long, but we broke them into smaller groups. So on this day, we, we uh, differentiated a bit, if you will, um, to honor the fact we have elementary, secondary, brand new teachers, some veteran teachers who have come over. I'll show you a little bit of that breakdown as well. Um, and also counselors, mental health, nurses, so a wide variety uh, come in on those couple of days. So you'll see those sessions that I'm going to now cover in order so we can advance. And I'll go over those now. Advance the slide, please. Teaching and learning through uh, professional learning communities, which I know the board is uh, well aware of given um, the excellent addition of the late start. Uh, opportunity where teachers are really learning and collaborating together around student data. And this was a chance for our team to guide new teachers through what that looks like, best practices, but also around academic expectations, best practices with instruction. And that was led by Tacey uh, Killingsworth and all the directors within learning services. We also had teachers on special assignment, very dynamic uh, session. Next session, next slide, please. We also, uh, IT had a second session, and this was around designing, designing learning experiences for all, given that we're in de uh, device rich environments. This was a walking through of the different platforms and giving them a chance to think through how does this look like in a classroom? And how do I think about classroom management with the fact that uh, students have devices at the ready? And that was uh, a session that was also fun and dynamic and got folks doing a lot of work together. Next slide. Creating a culture of belonging through social emotional learning. This is an SEL thread led by Maureen Lang. Um, got into the definitions, uh, the district definitions around SEL and belonging. Dove into ruler, sources of strength, and some other elements there. The definitions were used based on kind of created ones for SEL and belonging that I'll address. I think there might be questions on that after. Next slide. And the last uh, main or the last session was really split between uh, what we titled All Means All. So a group within special education and then special pops. I'll talk about those separate. Led by Dr. Belinda Luhan Lindsay and her team really got into inclusion best practices, um, student first language, um, our people first language, and some of the key elements of special education in District 20 specifically. Next slide. Uh, the second half of that was around special populations, uh, which we described as our ESL, English is uh, second language, TAG, that's uh, talented and gifted, McKinney Bento, um, the uh, homeless uh, students, foster care, family resource center, that's what we would describe in the district as a uh, special population. Again, with the centerpiece around inclusion, how do we best include? Those are the main training elements that we incorporated, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, one more structure. If you could advance, please. At the end of the day, we also offered a range of differentiated sessions based on, yeah, gave them time to reflect and uh, design some things um, based on their learning. 
Uh, we worked with our inductees. By the way, we have over 100 inductees, uh, which are new licensed staff. That's the most we've ever had in the district. Uh, so not only was 250 the most we've had for new licensed staff, over 100 of them uh, are in the process of induction, uh, which is what new staff go through with the state. Uh, Columbia Risk Assessment, which is threat assessment training. We gave them some choice and time to work with computers. So one of the nice benefits this year is we had an IT cafe set up. A lot of uh, late hires this year. We're getting laptops on the spot, getting direct support with technology, making sure they're up and running before students uh, hit their doors uh, that uh, next week. If you could advance. All right, so let's go into some data. So here's a little bit of a summary because we did extensive surveys, which we do every year, and we really dive into this data from a survey standpoint. So again, we were right around 250 with our count. That was pushed up right at the very end. Uh, thanks to tight uh, communication work with our human resources team, we were able to get in the last minute hires into uh, new licensed staff orientation. Um, we received uh, 182 uh, evaluations on the first day and 195 on the third day. Schools took care of the in-between day. If you could advance that slide. Uh, quick summary of the demographics. You'll see that first, that top line says, this will be my first year. So 54, that was the largest group. That's the one in blue. And then I'm looking at the other tail of that, 12 years or more. We have 44 who joined the district with 12 or more years experience, which means they're coming from out of state or other districts. Uh, it's definitely a draw to come to the district. Um, and you'll see some feedback that they provided based on that. Next slide. A little bit of a breakdown on elementary was our leading group um, in terms of demographic. Uh, high school is second, middle school is third, and then it kind of spread from there. Next slide. Overall ratings, we basically measured two things this year. How engaging was the session and how valuable and relevant. So we looked at those two things, like are we engaging you as adult learners? And is the material, the content valuable and relevant based on what you think you're getting into uh, coming into uh, teaching in District 20? So we had 86.4% uh, strongly agreed or agreed that the sessions were engaging. That was on average. And almost 91% strongly agreed or agreed that the sessions were valuable and relevant. So that's some areas I think to celebrate. Um, and I'm always looking for ways to get better. So I'll talk a little bit about that at the end too. On the next slide just shows a breakdown of each session. The first day, um, and the first day tends to be more on the compliance front um, and things got to know nuts and bolts. How are we going to keep you out of trouble? So seeing slightly lower numbers there for engagement is not is not shocking. Um, the fact that the high level of the, of the value that they saw with the percent that strongly agreed and agreed said, OK, this is really important. I better know this material. Um, the second day uh, was with more with learning services, and so you'll see how that data stacked up where several of the sessions actually were both above 90% with engagement and value uh, overall for the two days. So I think there's some things to celebrate uh, within that, and thanks to all the teams who helped plan um, those two days. Next slide. Um, I'm going to share some highlights because they gave a lot of comments. Uh, one thing, it's an optional thing. The first part was not optional. This was all optional. And we had hundreds of comments of folks really taking the time. Um, and I'll also highlight a few, but generally speaking, the time to connect, it matched some of our original goals. Like what were we trying to get them to feel, know, and do? Matched up in a lot of the feedback we received. They really loved the feeling coming in. They felt like they were welcome, belong, treated as professionals. Um, they liked the focus on students and academics and wellness overall as well organized and structured uh, came out uh, loud and clear. They felt valued. They liked the laughter and the fun and the fact that they had time to meet uh, key people in the district as well. Next slide. So some specific highlights to day one. Hearing from what they termed higher ups uh, came up a lot. And they really appreciated that. They really liked the introduction um, and opportunity to understand the strategic plan. Like this was a highlight for many, many people. Uh, it came up loud and clear in the comment section. Like. This is why I came and now it's reassuring me I'm in the right spot. I've come to the right district. You guys have a vision, you know where you're going and we appreciate that. Um, and some of the interactive game-based nature um, that honored learners. Next slide this is more specific to day three. Day three had uh, uh, engagement strategies, a lot of hands-on activities. So this is some of the feedback we heard, relevant, applicable to learning. They like the opportunity to learn with colleagues, talk with others and some time to reflect and apply their learning, uh, which is something we tried to emphasize this year more and more. Next slide. I'm gonna go through some quick quotes that we heard. So these are direct quotes now based on those themes. Um, they love the cheerleaders and other students were very welcoming as we walked in. 
set a positive tone uh, for the day. Truly felt welcomed and appreciated. That one I think is a nice snapshot. Next one, I love the energy of all staff members. It was a very welcoming environment and it got me feeling excited about the upcoming school year. Uh, knowing you kind of have to go through orientation coming in and for some it's okay, I got to do it. Uh, seeing these kind of positive uh, comments and there were a lot of them, so I think that's exciting. Next slide, I can go through a couple more. Appreciated the emphasis on the district mission and strategic plan. Made me feel even more confident my decision to join this district. Um, I really enjoyed the positivity by everyone. Uh, I haven't seen and felt so welcomed by a district. It really set a positive tone what will be an awesome year. That was that one to me hit, I think, most at home. That was our goal. When people feel like they're equipped and they know they're in the right place. Um, next slide. Everything was well organized. You'll see the re relevant applicable. It was wonderful to get familiar with people in the district, learn key information. And then again, they're feeling informed and prepared for the year. Today's orientation was great, engaging, excited to use what I learned in my planning. So many things were applicable to the classroom. Next slide. How purposeful it was, highly structured, focus on students, that was our goal. Uh, just love the active participation strategies. Um, as well as the respectful, dignified way we are treated as professionals. I want to emphasize that point too, and I think that's a really important part of our work when we train new hires. Next slide. Um, when it comes to suggestions, we got some good suggestions coming in too, and in fact today as a support to schools team within learning services and IT, we spent a lot of time mining the data and saying, what are we going to learn and get better on next year? And we start the planning very early on in this since it's such a big endeavor. Um, and I'll share some of those uh, uh, suggestions here in just a moment. But then we do a follow-up uh, survey in January, call the new hires, like, what did we miss? What stuck? And last year when we did this, we had over 120 took that survey, and it gave us great feedback to think, how do we adjust and get better, which is the main emphasis for me. Um, I'll talk about some of those suggestions because I think uh, a couple of you had a question about that, uh, and I'll get to that in just one second. Next slide. Uh, just a special thanks. I'm going to give a shout out for Pine Creek. It's a big deal to host this. It's not like they don't have anything else going on. Uh, uh, from the principal, the secretaries, janitorial, janitorial and custodial staff, and the students, of course, they were amazing. Um, all teachers of the year joined us to lead through the teacher's oath. Uh, we had cohort volunteers from our UCCS partnership. Food, Sodexo's food was absolutely amazing for the two days. A lot of compliments on the food. Uh, operations, keeping the AC, just a lot, and all the folks who participated. We just issued out over 100 thank yous to all the people who have helped make the event happen. It's a big deal, um, and just want to give thanks to those folks. What I'd like to do now is open up to questions, and I know I put a couple pause points in there, and I want to make sure uh, that I hit the questions. Mr. Temby. Uh, Jeremy, great report. Um, plus, we got a little bit more detail in a separate email with a lot of the specific comments, and, uh, and it was great to see. Um, couple things. One, I want to just kind of commend not only you for your leadership on this event, but uh, the entire cabinet and uh, and their teams. Uh, this takes a lot of work uh, and it carves out a lot of time, but it's important to set the right tone and tenor uh, for this organization. And D20 is an excellent uh, organization and uh, it's led uh, by great leaders throughout the cabinet. So I want to just commend you for the work and the tone and tenor that was set uh, through this event. Uh, question, compared to last year, were there any palpable or distinguishing moments, comments, threads that you saw or felt? Um, because times are changing. We've got a, we've got a teacher crisis out there. Um, the HR team's done yeoman work trying to get our numbers up, but we still have no applicants for certain positions. So uh, we're in a different environment than we were a while ago. So any kind of uh, intangibles out there from your standpoint? Yeah, and, and I think that's why we realized how important this year was. Yeah. And, you know, moving forward, we'll keep getting better because two years ago we did it all virtually in one day. Yeah. Uh, last year uh, we did a, a little bit of a hybrid, but it was in person. Masks were, you know, we were at that early stage of like, hey, can we get all the way back in? People were still pretty nervous to be together. Yeah. Um, this year, uh, back to what Mr. Gregory mentioned, there was a little lack of, there was a lack of fear and there was some excitement of having people together. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the fact we emphasize, we're going to treat you as professionals here. 
you're in a high performing, exciting district to be a part of. We're going to make sure you belong. We are going to set, maintain high expectations. And how do we help support you to get there? Um, and I think the survey data was, oh, it was overwhelmingly positive. Mm -hmm. And I tend to push on people to say, yes, and I want feedback on how we get better. And we're going to take that feedback um, because there's always ways to get better. And I look at the students who were there and the mm -hmm. welcoming uh, feeling, the lunchroom, seeing that lunchroom packed with 250 mm -hmm. people fed in 17 minutes because Sodexo had it dialed in. It was pretty incredible. Um, seeing that experience and seeing people talking together and meeting superintendent for a session, um, it, it did feel different than last year for sure. Uh, and I think part of it is the excitement. We're coming into something mm -hmm. more, it feels more positive this year, maybe less fear um, to that point. Now we adapted to a, rem a remote world, but um, I spent a long time in the hotel industry and just to see what happens at conferences uh, where people get to connect talk, uh, build relationships or whatever, it's invaluable. Agreed. And doing things remotely, you just can't do that stuff. So this was great. So thank you very much. Mr. Salt. Thank you. Um, as Mr. Timmy said, great report. I really appreciated that. I also wanted to thank you and your team for really making sure that there was a, a strong focus on the end statements. I think that's really, I mean, that's, that's why we're all here for those students and those ends. And the fact that that's what you were highlighting, I really appreciate that. Um, I had a couple questions. Um, just looking for the definitions. You mentioned the SEL and the um, belonging, and I know we had done the belonging focus group ago. Um, was that earlier this year, several months ago? And so I was curious if you could help me. Uh, what were the definitions that you guys were were using through that? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll reference the social emotional learning one first. Um, and this one's really coming also from state and kind of based on state standards. So it's connected to that. So Maureen Lang and her team have worked on this. Social and emotional learning is the process through which individuals acquire and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to establish positive relationships, achieve personal and academic goals, identify and manage emotions, develop care and concern for others, and make responsible decisions. So that's the working SEL definition in the district. Thank you. And then just to be clear, that is a district specific that Ms. Ling and her team have kind of worked to develop. Right. And it's kind of pooled from other resources. Sure. But that's yeah. that's our definition. Thank you. And then for the belonging, was that the one that was used with from that uh, work group? Correct. So okay. the working group, um, the definition, and this is, grab um, uh, it right here. Yes. So belonging means everyone is accepted and feels heard, valued, and safe in a thriving community. Uh, and that one was co-created with quite a bit of input uh, over a couple months span, taking feedback from students. There was a nice little uh, student focus group opportunity and some survey data, but that was uh, the working definition. Yeah, I had actually had the privilege of sitting in on a couple of sessions. And it was it was phenomenal. So uh, thank you for that. Um, and then the last thing you talked about a little bit was, you know, I, I appreciate that we have a lot of positive feedback, but it's hard to grow from positive feedback. And so I was just curious, um, and, but you talked a lot about kind of what we're doing to, to do better next year. I think that follow up in January is really a fantastic idea to kind of say what were those spots that we we didn't catch. So uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, and if I can speak to those, some of the suggestions, um, even like last year, thinking about adding a day and knowing there's a cost factor to that because we pay teachers a stipend. By the way, not all districts do that. So that <laughs> came for like good for us for paying a stipend and recognizing professionals and paying them. Um, so uh, some of the things that did come up, um, just keep the focus on adult learning, more engagement, keep us more engaged. Can we spread out the learning a bit more? And I think this is really important feedback is how well do we onboard um, after those two days and orient new staff who come in and just missed the window or they came in at the last day. We've got a whole group of people and we'll probably continue to face this. That's something we're really working to tighten up and making sure people feel onboarded and properly oriented to the district if they miss those couple of days, which is a challenge because it's so important to keep them in buildings, but it's something we're working closely with our uh, human resources team on right now. Thank you so much. Ms. Conjure. Um, was the going back to the school, you know, in this in the second day, was that part of one of the conversations from <clears throat> previous years yep. was that they wanted that? That's what I thought I remembered from a couple of years back. <clears throat> and I loved it because 
uh, of just the opportunity those teachers then got to know their own schools and they weren't just the new guy kind of you know feeling like all the freshmen do I'm sure right now but um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for uh, this we were all able to go to your opening ceremony I guess um, that that m first morning and it was so obvious to all of us that the people that were in that room um, were ready to go and that said as we did our school tours I was at the village um, yesterday um, and uh, a man stepped up to me, introduced as a brand new teacher this year. Um, and from, anyway, a really great teacher from a different district. We're kind of lucky to have snagged him in and you might know who I'm talking about. And he mentioned specifically speaking with Mr. Gregory for a while on some coaching things and just different things that it, it wasn't just, I mean, it was focused on the professionalism and things like that, but the idea that somebody from cabinet and superintendent and that level is going to come and, and welcome them. He mentioned, and his name's Jimmy, if you didn't know, uh, his, I told him I was going to say his name, but um, he, he said, I felt so much like that belonging piece that I, I'm sure one of those was his that was written down about I felt like I was at the place where I was supposed to be um and but that it had gone past your few days and now was being implemented in the school where he still was feeling it and is is in that place you know so it felt like that connection had been made and certainly the village um has a kind of special way to be able to do that as far as the smallness of that school. Um, and that I guess the other thing that I just wanted to mention um, is um, based on what you were saying, Mr. Salt, um, about the um, SEL and things like that. I think that with the idea that we're going to be back more in person and doing things like that, I would just encourage anybody who's listening to go and get involved this year in the parent academies because when you're questioning what national narratives are saying about what SEL means or whatever, to pull the focus and recognize what we're actually talking about is not that far off and it is focused on children and it is focused on good things. Um, and Maureen and her team do such a great job with those um, bringing in speakers and, and things like that. So I, I just would make a plug for that because it's an invaluable um, free session once a month. Thank you, Ms. Conjure. Uh, Ms. Cons. Um, just real briefly, thanks to the whole team of district staff, because it was really exciting just to be there for a half an hour or an hour. And, you know, I can't imagine what all the new staff felt. Well, we read how they felt. So I'm just, I'm proud to be a part of this district because we know that not every district does this for their new staff. Um, I'm just pulling out a grain, a tiny grain here, because I, I intended to say it in my board comments, but um, with the device rich environments session, I was glad to see that because as we've mentioned for a variety of reasons, we are in a new age and I feel for the teachers and the students whose learning is not always optimal with all the cell phones and the devices in the room. So I'm glad you addressed that. And I was just really pleased to see on every one of our da daughter's syllabi, that she brought home on Monday, every single teacher said they had the cell cell, you know, a cell for the cell phones. <laughs> so I just think it's super important. I'm glad we're talking to new staff right off the bat. And I hope it's, um, you know, everyone has their own ways and different classroom models, but I hope it, it becomes uh, the majority of the practice that we can get those distractions. The, the cell phones and stuff. I know we have computers, obviously they're working, but I'm just proud of the teachers for holding those high standards for the students because it gets messy, I know, but um, they're doing a good job trying to hold their ground. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kozlak. I was gonna say, I, I believe this is my fourth one of these that I've heard and, and you do make changes. And I, I really applaud y'all instead of just going like, this is what we do it, 
pound sand if you don't like it. No, you say, we, we want to listen. We want to hear what can we do better. And I think that's it's indicative of the responses that, that you get, that they're positive. People are like, yeah, this is really good because you listened. And and I'm echoing what other people said, but man, going back in January, what did we miss? That's that's just a wonderful idea. I wish I had thought of it. I would, I would have told you, <laughs> but I didn't. Um, was it two years ago that you were here? This is my third year. Yes, because I remember you got here just about the time COVID was hitting and we were doing the new teacher and it was like, I'm, I'm glad to see that it's it's more of a normal pace for you. I, I remember feeling sorry is too strong a term, but it's like, oh, my goodness, Dr. Kozlak is just getting pounded. He's brand new with everything going on. But uh, th this is just a great y'all did a great job and I, and I really appreciate it. Board, anything else? Mr. Gregory? I, I know I'm not a board member, but there was a question asked about what um, is there anything different or do you? I had an aha and it was uh, at the very beginning. And I think I've even spoken with some others about this when I think Ms. Cortez asked, you know, the room of 250 uh, new quote unquote new teachers. Uh, if you're you know, brand new, stand up. And then if you've, you know, you're not new, but have taught, you know, less than five years, stand up and went through the whole. There was just so folks in here know, the average age in that room was not 23, uh, far from it. And I guess the one slide that showed uh, whatever it was 20 years or 12 years plus of 44 people, uh, that made me start to think. Uh, we know, because we can see data, that colleges aren't producing enough teachers to fill vacancies just in Colorado alone, but that's across the nation. Um, and in speaking to some of these folks throughout the day, uh, my aha was a lot of these folks are making a career change, right? Either they're uh, leaving the military or w whatever the reason may be, they're making a career change. Um, and that is going to be, I think, our next most lucrative pool of applicants is not just the 23 year olds coming out of college, um, but those who are making a career change and I say this because I don't have details yet, but um, Dr. Kozlek and Mr. Smart are in process of um, making it easier in District 20 for that career change to happen. Lower some of the hurdles, remove some of the barriers, or at least let us help these folks make the change. Because I have talked to several um, folks and part of the, the frustration is what's required to be a teacher uh, you know, you have to spend a semester student teaching and, and all of these components uh, are challenging and prevent some folks from from who want to enter the field, prevents them from doing so. So my message to you is my aha was we need to we need to tap that market uh, or make it easier for those folks to uh, make their career change to teaching. And that is uh, as we speak, I'll say uh, Dr. Koslek and Mr. Smart are working on something uh, to help with that. So. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Next is resolution 266-22 approval of the District Accountability Committee DAC charge and membership for 22-23. May we have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion, please. Ms. Kahn's. Dr. Field is ready to lead that. Thank you. Yes, and Ms. Cons, you needed to brag on yourself and Jim and I from the rah-rah because we were the only team that got the slingshot to work. That's because you only had the only working one. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I got to know the new turf uh -huh. because I was I stayed on my knees. I was the launcher, so I had to be yes, really low. Really well. And I was crawling on that artificial turf on my knees and I had rug burns for days. Oh, I so. bet. I earned it. Thank you for the props. Yeah, but, but I heard a lot of really good um, comments from people in the stands who I've seen later this week how impressed they were with our slingshot team. I just wanted to go on record as saying that. <laughs> so real quickly, I am pleased to share information about the District Accountability Committee and its charge. As a Board of Education Committee, the charge for the DAC comes directly from the board and is explicitly established to support the work of the board. In addition, the Membership of the DAC, which I'm going to talk about in just a second, must be approved by the board each school year. The DAC charge, which is aligned with the state statute as well as GP 4.8, has not been changed for the coming school year, but is as follows. So the DAC's charge really has 
10 big things that we cover. So the DAC recommends to the board priorities for spending school district monies in consultation with each school's accountability committee. The second one is that we advise the board concerning district and school accreditation and the creation of the appropriate performance plan for the district. And this part, this works then in partnership with Joe Lynn and the assessment office, and we will be receiving our district performance framework for the first time since 2019 next Wednesday. And schools will all be receiving their school performance frameworks. We also review charter applications prior to consideration by the board. We form an accreditation subcommittee to review the district's accreditation process and make recommendations about the school district's uh, UIP as well as plans for each school. And this is a big part of DAC's work that we do this fall. We also form a budget subcommittee to inform the district's budget process, receive input from each SAC regarding the school's needs and financial priorities, and make recommendations to the Board of Education regarding priorities for spending school district monies. And this is accomplished through the district's, um, I'm sorry, through DAC's budget subcommittee, and they meet in January. We also annually review and provide feedback for site plans and the unified improvement plans for each school in the district. That happens in November. We provide input and recommendations on the advisory basis concerning the development and use of assessment tools used for measuring and evaluating student academic growth. Um, the DAC also considers input from school accountability committees concerning areas like principal evaluations. The DAC also is focused on increasing parent engagement in the school district and its public schools. And finally, provides input concerning the creation and enforcement of the district's conduct and discipline code. So our first DAC meeting is Tuesday, coming up this Tuesday, the 23rd of August. And as you know, this time of year, DAC's membership is still evolving, um, but we will, we will be close to having a final and full roster of participants. And hopefully by Tuesday, when we start DAC, we will have a full um, group of uh, team members. I think we're still waiting on seven parents. So to that end, a complete and updated membership list will be shared at the October 6th board meeting. And after that, the DAC will ask for the board's permission to manage its membership appropriately. So currently, um, and I know that uh, Ms. Matson updated you uh, later this afternoon, we currently have 38 parents that are all going to be serving on DAC. And so we plan to add seven more, so we'll be up around 45 or so. We have 10 school district administrators. So we used to have one administrator from every building there. So now I have um, two from the elementary, two from the middle, two from the high school that are there. Some are principals, some are assistant principals at each of the levels. And then myself as a district administrator. Uh, we also have added uh, Lori Hartman as a uh, administrator representing the IT team. And then JoLynn Patterson and Tacey Killingsworth, who work very closely with me on accreditation work. Tina is a member. Ms. Collins is a member. And then we also have one community member this year. So that's our committee so far. We're very excited to meet on Tuesday. This is an amazing, energetic group of people focused on important work in District 20. Do you all have any questions? Mr. Temby. Uh, not a question, but a comment. Uh, if you go back to, is it page one or two? Yeah, page one. Uh, looks like the fourth paragraph down, it talks about the composition of the committee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, uh, just for people who aren't familiar with District Accountability Committee, we've got one of the largest in the state out of the 178 school districts. So you look at the minimum, it says it shall consist of three parents of students. And obviously there's a lot of small districts, uh, but we have no problem fulfilling this composition <laughs> uh, uh, paragraph here. Uh, but uh, I think it's just a testament to our parents' interest in what's going on in this district mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how accessible our administration uh, and team are to those parents. And so, uh, but uh, as Nicole is finding out, it's a passionate group of involved people and uh, we should be very proud of it. So thank you. Mr. Salt. Thank you. Um, I just really wanted to to publicly acknowledge and thank all of the folks who have stepped up to serve on this deck. I know it's a, a time commitment and I appreciate that they are willing to step up from each of their schools to represent their populations and really advocate for themselves and their their students. So 
Thank you to all of you. So we're looking for seven more parents. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Field. I, and I too, I told myself I would never let us discuss a DAC without me publicly thanking the DAC members for, for their volunteer work. They do a lot. I know Mr. Temby, you were the chair and um, it's a it's a lot of work and it's important work and it's really good work and they do a great job. We have two committees on this Board of Education. One is the Audit Committee and the other is DAC. So that's it, just two standing committees. We do have a temporary CBOC, but um, so it's a very important committee and, and I really appreciate uh, everything that they do. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kunz. I don't know, sorry, Dr. Field. If we have the seven schools, do we know them or should we just take a peek at the list and watch for them to come in? Tina knows. Okay. And she's made a lot of phone calls today. Okay. So we'll look for that. Thank you so much. Mr. Gregory. Just one quick note too. One, one other thing that our DAC is large, uh, which differentiates us from many other even large districts. But another difference in ours is that uh, we always have, uh, always have had representatives from um, TCA and New Summit, which is, which is uncommon also um, that they are, you know, they choose members, but both New Summit and TCA have um, longstanding, yes, well, and obviously TCA also, longer, but, uh, and, and active participants. Right, they participate in our accreditation review when we do the UIP and site plan in November, they participate there too. Thank you, Dr. Field. Um, Mark Sacolitti is not here. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mrs. Cons? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Salt? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. Thank you for keeping me honest. Uh, Mark Sacolitti, who is off tonight, has his birthday August 27th. We wish him happy birthday. Was our business this evening focused on activities that promote and honor our mission statement, our belief statements, and our global end statement that reminds us that all students will have the knowledge, skills, and character necessary for successful transition to the next level, and upon graduation will be fully prepared for success? This meeting is adjourned.